So good evening, everybody. Good afternoon, and wherever you are seated, as I had mentioned earlier on, uh, my name is David Indeje, a communications person, communication officer, Kicktonet. And Kicktonet is a multi stakeholder platform for people and institutions interest, interested in ICT policy. And uh, we are guided by four pillars, policy, advocacy, stakeholder engagement, capacity building, and research, and our guiding philosophy uh, that we abide to each and every day is to encourage synergies for ICT policy related activities and initiatives. And we provide a net, we as such, the network provides mechanisms and framework for continuing cooperation, collaboration in ICT matters among industry, technical community, the academia, media development partners and government so that the issues that we speak about we are able to see what end result or outcome can can emanate from it so that we have something that is transformative within our, the societies that we live in when it comes to ict policy and initiatives so at this particular juncture i would like to invite sheryl oyer who is the main moderator for this particular Kicktonet space titled Ending, o Ending Online Gender-Based Violence. Let's talk about X content moderation. Our hashtag tonight, Kicktonet Spaces. Cheryl, welcome. Um, thank you very much, David, for that wonderful um, introduction of what Kicktonet does. My name is Sherry Oyer. I am the Programs Officer Digital Rights and um, Women Digital Rights at Kicktonet. And I'm very happy to be here tonight to discuss these issues. And as David has pointed out um, on, on what we do at Kicktonet, this is just one of the things that we, um, digital rights are some of the things that we deal with. As you heard, we are an, an ICT policy think tank and therefore digital rights um, fall just right at our doorstep and when you talk about digital rights um we of we definitely also will be talking about issues of online gender-based violence and today's topic is reporting mechanisms for of social media platforms and how effective are they and also we are also looking at issues of content content generation and i think um when you talk about content and moderation and um, reporting mechanisms we have seen several times um online gender-based violence playing um, right before us, before our faces on, 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 on online platforms. And the question is, are there reporting mechanisms in the first place? And um, is there the content moderation, is it actually working? And therefore, this is just the, some of the things we'll be talking about. Um, these are some of the questions we'll be asking tonight. And I have very wonderful um, experts today to help us just uncover these issues. Um, I'll, I'll introduce them. The first uh, speaker is Victor Capio. Victor is a trustee at Kicktonet. And um, also we have Angela Minayo, who is um, a programs officer, digital rights and policy at Article 19. Um, welcome both of you. And um, thank you very much for accepting to speak to us tonight. And I think I'll just go straight to the first question and I'll just direct, direct that question to Angela. And um, so we, as, as I've stated that we have seen a surge of online gender-based violence um, in social media platforms in and in Kenya um, and <laughs> the social media platform, one of them that you can speak about is the one that you are on right now, that is X. Um, so the question, when we see this, um, these forms of online gender-based violence, the question is, are there reporting, are there existing reporting mechanisms on these platforms? And what are the, if you, in your estimate, what are the awareness rates of the reporting mechanisms by users in Kenya? Welcome, Angela. Hi. Um, so I was talking about what content moderation is, uh, first of all. So content moderation really can be a mix of um, measures that a platform takes to moderate content on their platforms. This could be human content moderators. It could be uh, automated content moderation practices, such as the use of algorithms. It can also be other practices, such as down rating content or even putting a disclaimer on a content. Maybe you've seen this on X where there's a context feature and just giving users context that, hey, this, this could be misinformation or 
this is uh, not correct for whatever reasons. So those those mix of measures will be what we call content moderation. Now we are talking about if the effective if the self reporting mechanisms where users are allowed to report content is working. So this is normally seen in most social media platforms. You will see three dots um, at the post, the very uh, top of the post, and you can click and uh, report that content for whatever reasons. Um, it is my opinion that these uh, self-reporting measures have such certain lapses, which I will talk about later in the in the uh, in the space. But just to paint a picture, is most users normally do not know about the three dots. Uh, platforms themselves are not making intentional and deliberate effort to educate their users on how to report or even how the reporting uh, processes work. So I'll just end it at that as an icebreaker and you can go to the next question. Okay, thank you very much Angela for just pointing out the fact that um, most users actually don't know um and i think we'll be going into we'll, we'll going we'll be going into that um later on and just how to bridge that gap in terms of um knowledge of of these mechanisms by users so um the next um i'll go to victor now and victor um what are some of the reporting procedures and um let's say there's an instance of um of abuse online what are the chain of events that follow once a report has been made um, by a user for instance on on these platforms um, thank you very much Sherry. i think first of all it is important for users to be aware of um, the um, <coughs> community standards for whichever social media platform that um, they are on so that already provides a basis to determine whether um, any post um, that the user views uh, constitutes a violation of, um, of uh, the specific platform's uh, rules or uh, community standards for that matter, because the platforms will only uh, respond to posts or take down posts that violate their community standards or rules, if, for example, you're using X. So uh, once the user understands the um, community standards and uh, rules, then they're able to then um, locate the specific content. And um, sometimes um, users can identify content which actually is not uh, violating the community standards. Sometimes uh, the content can be in violation of community standards uh, because we know that um, uh, we have the right to freedom of expression and opinion and sometimes you find that there could be posts which might you know offend somebody but they are not really uh offenses just because somebody says something you don't like doesn't mean um it is necessarily a violation however because we are talking about uh, online gender-based violence um we find that most of the social media platforms already have uh you know provided for various forms of online gender-based violence as uh, areas where they address their community standards. So once um, you're aware of the rules, then you can now come to the content and say, this is the specific post. Does it actually um, constitute any of the grounds um, that have been outlined in the community standard? So if you're able to find that, then we go to the specific post and this post can be on the different areas of the application whether it is, uh, it is a specific tweet or is it it's even a uh a, a Twitter space like this or it is even a specific user um and depending on the platform there's always an option there's three dots where a user can uh, can click to either if you're using android to flag the specific post or if you are using I mean, that's on iOS devices, or if you're using Android devices, you click on the three dots, then you find that uh, for most of the platforms, they will provide you with a uh, small option to classify the specific content to anyone, which specific community standard um, you think uh, has been violated. So there's a classification menu where you can now categorize um, if you find that perhaps 
uh, let's say the post was uh, uh, an image of, of a child who, or or displaying a child sex abuse content, then you can go to the relevant category and, and select. Um, also, uh, the platforms allow users to, to, to give reasons why you believe that that specific post is a violation of um, the community standard, or to provide, um, you know, additional additional context uh, for that post. So, for example, if you find this is uh, child sex abuse content, then you can actually make a description that this is an image of a child. Um, or the person, the represented person looks like a child or is underage and uh, whatever is happening to the child is is potentially violation of the community standard in this and that way. Um, then you'll have an option to submit the complaint. And in typical practice, um, most of the platforms will give you feedback and say they have received a particular complaint and um, they will respond to they will review and um, if they find that it violates the community standard or rules then they will take the necessary action and uh, if they find that it doesn't um, then um, they might uh, indicate that uh, it did not violate the community standard or rule uh, also the um, in addition to the post, you can actually also report the specific uh, user who posted that content in the same specific way and for the same, the same reasons. And most of the platforms will also give you additional options. For example, uh, whether mute posts from that person or to block that person so that then you don't uh, see their content uh, on, your, on your timeline. Uh, <coughs> And then, uh, if there's any further action, then the platform either gets back to you with um, additional feedback and expect, you know, that is the, uh, you will find then that if they take an action, then the post is going to be um, taken down. If they don't um, take any action to the post, then they will also indicate to you that um, no action has been taken. Although we, we have a big challenge especially in this part, uh, because uh, many people report uh, posts but don't uh, get feedback from the from the platform. So it's still an area where um, there's a bit of a, of a challenge. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much, Victor, for just illustrating that um, that that procedure of reporting and just still when you still have the mic um i think for just for clarity where do like users get community the the community standards you've talked about community standards and perhaps someone does not understand where do you get the community standards to even um evaluate whether there is any violation so could you just maybe um just shed some light on that oh, okay yes so all the um Unfortunately, the, the challenge we have with most of the platforms is that um, the links to the community standards are usually in very small prints. And um, they, you scroll, uh, for example, you're using the desktop browser, for example, you will find at the bottom of the page, there will be links to terms of service uh, or those rules. And that is one way of, of, of um, getting to them. Um, the other option is, for example, if you're on, on X, you can go to your profile and then you can go find the link to help and support. So you'll also find, find those terms and conditions there. Um, the other option is you can just uh, go to Google and just search um, Twitter rules or Twitter community standards or, you know, Facebook uh, or Instagram standards, and then it will direct you to the page if you can't navigate the application because the big challenge is that most of the, the links are usually tucked down in small menus. So it makes it a bit hard for, for people to actually get to the content. And also for new users, when they are signing up, you'll find that um, this, uh, the links to the standards and the rules are going to be displayed on the registration page uh, when you are signing in. So those are uh, easy ways to get access to the community standards and the and the role. 
Okay. Um, th thank you very much for that clarification. Um, I think now it's clearer where to get community of standards just for that for purposes of ensuring that when you're reporting you know what what it is that you're reporting about and whether it meets those standards and i think um you have touched a bit on this but i just want to um delve into it on issues of um oh, you've talked about the review and response and i think you mentioned that um issues of takedown of uh, offensive posts for instance on this in this he mentioned on this side is is a bit um it's not at its optimum so um what i want to know are, are the reporting mechanisms effective in terms of action taken by platform owners um and and if you could give us maybe like some real life context just to draw a picture on on how maybe um effective and how responsive these platforms are Yes, thank you. Um, I'd mentioned that this is usually has been a big challenge um, for, 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 for platforms. Number one, I think we just need to appreciate that there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of content that sometimes violates uh, the community standards. And if you look at it in terms of the number of countries and the number of users who are on the platform, um, it, is, uh, it is complicated to, you know, investigate all incidents and quickly resolve those issues because actually um, the violations are happening almost every day and people are posting almost every day and so it's a um, it's a um, logistical nightmare to take down this content um, notwithstanding that um, reason is that you know we know that these um, platforms are have access to technology such as uh, you know artificial intelligence and uh, automated content moderation systems to enable them to detect and flag um, some of this content on their platforms. Um, they've also put in place these reporting mechanisms uh, which uh, provide an opportunity for uh, you know reports to be made and for those to be reviewed. Um, so there's an expectation by users that um, platforms are able to invest, should rather invest in in building their systems to be more responsive and effective um, to respond to reports from users because ultimately those reports um you know uh, help make the platforms safer for users however um you know research has shown that uh, platforms are usually very slow to respond to um to take down content and especially in this region where we have um you know people speaking different languages that are not uh, english or french or you know languages spoken in the western world so for example if someone were to you know write something in swahili or in dolu or in kikuyu or in Biryama that uh, you know it would constitute harassment of someone um a number of these platforms don't have um interpretation capacity or local languages that we speak in our region so that language barrier means that uh, some of this content uh, will remain uh, on and um, the evaluation will persist um also there's also the issue of that uh, you know we don't have the platforms dedicating sufficient resources in terms of content moderators and human reviewers who actually understand the language and the context that uh, we are in so someone who speaks Giriyama can, you know, look at a post that is written in Giriyama text, for example, and be able to, you know, facilitate the moderation of that content. Um, also, there's just content which um, is just ignored that um, there have been a number of incidences and reports by people that um, they've made reports, but uh, the platforms just remained inactive. And um, it's difficult. Um, they make it difficult for people to make multiple reports over the same type of content, which then makes, if they don't take action, then that content remains up. So that also is a problem in terms of, uh, of you know, response time, because um, the, um, the slow response time then uh, means that the content will stay up for much longer than, than it actually would. Um, another problem is that also people don't uh, people don't usually report 
um, you know, there is always the imagination that someone else is going to report. Uh, but you who have seen it, you'll only share it and share it to someone else and say, hey, look, look at what this guy has posted. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if people find it disagreeable, um, nobody takes action. Partly also because uh, people don't understand that uh, it's important to flag and report that content to the platform so that then actually they, they can actually take action. So um, it's almost similar to how when you walk in the streets of Nairobi and you know there was a time you could walk and see someone getting mugged and you know, that because it's not you, you will continue walking. And I suspect that sometimes we have that attitude on social media that even when harm is happening, uh, because we are not directly affected or we think we are not directly affected, then we are not going to take action to report. So that's taking that responsibility to be our brother or our sister's keeper then uh, also presents a challenge um, for us in our region. Um, thank you, Victor, for that perspective. That yeah, we that the perspective that also as users we have that responsibility of making those reports, and then um, of course the the platforms also have that responsibility uh, going ahead. Um, Angela, um, we now turn back to the users. We talk. We've talked about the platforms a lot now. I just want to know, and I think. Um, from the work that you do, I think this is something that you would be very well placed to answer. Um, in terms of, um, I'm sure you've sometimes seen, uh, you're one of the people who are very, um, who take that, that action to make those reports. Um, and I'm just asking, what are some of the common challenges faced by users when using these reporting mechanisms on social media platforms? Um, if you have made, if you've, in, in, at one point you've made reports, what was the experience for you as well? So I'll answer that question in two parts. I'll answer that question from a user reporting mm -hmm. and I'll answer that question from the perspective of a, user's, a user whose content has been reported. Okay. Um, uh, because at Call 19, we believe in freedom of expression, in free speech as much as possible, even on uh, social media platforms. And we believe that uh, platforms should not uh, unnecessarily restrict content unless it is uh, a lawful limitation of freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. Uh, so from a point of uh, user reporting, because I, I report content a lot on social media platforms, on X, the first challenge I've seen is that they will tell you that we have received your report, but they will not tell you what happened to that report. So you will maybe just see the content, the content you reported still on, but uh, there's no response from the platform to tell you we did not think it violates our community standards mm -hmm. or we decided to take it down or things like that. And it's a lack of transpa transparency and accountability around content moderation that really needs to be uh, a concern for us because there's a platform owner who has the right to either pull down content or not, but they're not telling you the reasons for their actions. So even from a point of view of asking myself, okay, what should I report next? Or did it fall in the different in a different category that I did not uh, put? I will not have uh, that option. Uh, the second challenge is that uh, online gender-based violence is still quite a relatively new um, phenomena. And it seems like platform really might not understand how it manifests or even what might look like it's not online gender-based violence is in fact with the right context uh, being given to the platform owners. So if you do not have an interactive uh, reporting mechanism, you fail to get context and to understand the language uh, nuances that is being reported in this particular content. I totally, totally agree with Victor that content moderation is quite complex given the reach and scale of social media. But if you're giving users a chance to also report content, that can be a resource, uh, even making them have a better database around uh, harmful content in the regions that they operate. So that lack of transparency and accountability is a big issue. Um, Thirdly, I think is we put too much reliance on users to actually report content. As Victor has said, uh, not all users feel the moral obligation to report content. And therefore, uh, platforms cannot just rely on users alone to moderate content on their platforms. Uh, after all, to be very honest, you're not making money by moderating, helping X mm -hmm. moderate content. 
you are not sharing in the profits or in the dividends they make every year. So the, that, that over-reliance on users to report is a challenge. And therefore, we need to see more also proactive measures from the platforms themselves to moderate content and to even be more transparent about their practices, about their human rights stance, and even to include that in their annual transparency reports. Now to speak on the uh, side of the person whose content has been reported. Um, again, here we have the problem of engagement. There are times platforms will pull down content and not explain the reasons why this uh, content has been removed. Or re if it is an account that was suspended, uh, reactivate the account and not even give reasons why it was suspended in the first place. There are no uh, appeal mechanisms so that someone can say, uh, I do not think this is unlawful content, and here are my reasons. Uh, if you look at the appeals mechanism, if a user wants to take the next step, which is normally court or arbitration, these platforms are established in the global north uh, in the United States, and who has the, you know, the financial power and uh, access to legal uh, advice to go after X, uh, Meta, or whatever other platform in the US courts. So, and this is the reason why I feel uh, content moderation as it is right now is uh, broken and we need to work from a multi-stakeholder uh, point of view, having platforms, civil society, academia, activists, uh, openly and honestly talk about content moderation uh, practices. I'll give you an example of, I know feminist activists, feminist pages, even civil society pages that were pulled down with no reason and no way to appeal these decisions. So from a freedom of expression point of view, the content moderation practices should not just be pro the user who is reporting content, but you should also have in mind the user whose content is about to be pulled down. Thank you. Thank you very much angela for that dual um perspective from the report the user who's reporting and from the point of view of um the user whose content is being um who is being is being reported and i think um you have touched a bit on on issues of freedom of expression and i and my next question i'll just while well, you still have the mic um is still related to that and um i am imagining that there are barriers um to even reporting mechanisms for instance, I think also Victor also um, touched a bit on issues of local languages that are being used to perpetuate um, online gender-based violence, the issues of algorithmic biases, and um, of course the issue of the freedom of expression versus harmful content. Um, how do these barriers contribute to the challenges of content moderation and what are some strategies to adopt to circumvent this, uh, these challenges? Angela. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, so first of all, uh, the language issue has always been a challenge because while most of the terms and conditions and the community guidelines are in English, we know that uh, even among ourselves, there are people who do not speak English, they both speak their own local languages. Uh, the other issue is uh, uh, explainability of community guidelines. They're quite inaccessible. We need it to be in much more simpler terms. And still on explainability, there are times where platforms change their terms of use and not even inform uh, their users that we have added this new policy or things like that. And it's only maybe among us who work in the industry that will realize, oh, TikTok has an AI policy or, oh, X has come up with a new trust and safety policy for this and that. So I, I really want platforms to be more um, transparent uh, around their content moderation practices because it lifts the veil around this uh, secrecy of what happens. Uh, in the whole reporting table, we can only imagine, we don't know which content is subjected to automation, which content is subjected to human decision makers, or if it's a mix or, of both. So I'll say those are the lapses I've seen and it will just need more engagement with platforms. Um, finally, I think it's just uh, looking at content moderation beyond the global north lens. And this is a quite a nuanced uh, topic uh, I will not get into. But just to give you an idea, uh, even uh, terms on nudity and obscenity can not apply the same in different regions they operate. For instance, uh, in a country like Brazil, they have the carnival and they, they show up in quite scanty um, 
outfits but that is their culture and so the same content will be subjected to a global north perspective on decency and culture and it can bring out a uh, very absurd um, results so i will just call for more engagement with social media platforms and also for social media platforms to have uh, a respect for human rights behind these uh, content moderation practices you will realize that uh, content moderation is quite um, a sensitive topic for things like hate speech and they take that very seriously so they, they, we need the same seriousness they take to anti-semitism to hate speech also to be reflected in online gender based violence which as i have said is, is not being taken very seriously i have reported posts that are bordering on bullying and nothing happens i have reported uh, posts on uh, showing very gory pictures i think uh, you remember when rita waini case uh, came up and people are sharing the dismembered body parts some of those posts are still up mm -hmm. so it's not balanced i will also say that uh, it's like the very firm on certain content uh, certain harmful content but they do not show the same firmness when it comes to online gender based violence okay um thank you um and just while i still have you you mentioned um the feminist and activist pages being pulled down and i just wanted to know from um maybe from an al algorithm is it a bias or is this just um because sometimes you hear about shadow banning and all that is it an issue of the algorithm is biased or is this just um bias across the board <laughs> So these algorithms are trained on data, and if the data source, the, the data sets they're using are already biased, we're going to have a biased content moderation results. So I will say the bias is beyond even just content moderation, and it's about this normalization of uh, abuse against women. Uh, women also accepting this uh, bias by themselves because they don't sometimes they don't see anything wrong with uh, content being posted about them. We do not even see them being the face of activism around online gender-based violence, and I accept if that is a decision they have made on their own. But it's a mix of internalized misogyny in our culture, mm -hmm. and that normalization being seen online, and the harmful content that is really just going under the radar in terms of content moderation. Wonderful, thank you, thank you, and Victor. I I, I think I'll just also just briefly also just pull you into this question and and from um freedom of expression point of view and the legal impact implications of the right to freedom of expression versus harmful content how is that balance how do we balance between those two and also just ensuring that um still we don't have content that is is offensive online yeah i mean i agree that i just want that um you know, I think as a general rule, we we must prioritize protection of human rights um, at all times. I think for me, that is where I come from. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, because we 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 we, we can we can't uh, it is unacceptable um, for you know harm to be permitted or to continue. Uh, regardless of who is leading or uh, leading. So um, the call that we have been making over the years is that technology companies, whether in their processes, governments in their processes, uh, must take action to prevent the harm that uh, can be caused by some of these technologies. Mm -hmm. um, a number of uh, processes now require that uh, companies uh, undertake human rights due diligence uh, so mm -hmm. that then we actually look at what is the potential harm that our products are likely to cause or are causing um, across the entire life cycle of the product. And they take action to address it. And um, government are also now being encouraged to legislate on how to actually require companies to undertake mandatory due diligence, basically an investigation of the potential harm of human rights of their products and services, and to take action to mitigate the harm. 
and that also address the harm when it occurs. So I think that is where we stand at the moment. Okay, Th thank you, thank you very much. Um, I I think I'll just for our listeners, um, we I'm just going to be giving you a. A, an opportunity also to ask questions and also reflect maybe you can even share like some experiences that you've had as well or what you've seen online but i'm going to ask the last question to um not really the last question but i'm going to ask this question to both victor and angela but even as i prepare to ask this question i think i'm a bit afraid because of <laughs> what has what we've been discussing in terms of um we have it uh, uh, it's we've painted such a, a grim picture on these reporting mechanisms and what is being done in their effectiveness but i just wanted to know do you have any success uh, successful uh, highlights of successful reporting and content mentorization in interventions in kenya any that you could think of that maybe you could share with us that could also just be a precursor to what could happen and what um what 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 proper content moderation and reporting mechanisms can actually do if you have any please share with us and also for the listeners please um feel free to come in next with um questions and reflections as well angela you can go first um so for me i would say first of all that uh, content moderation is quite complex and um, what might look like it's success it might not be as successful so please uh, reduce expectations to zero but I will say that uh, I like the new uh, ways in which social media platforms are becoming very, um, very responsive. So for instance, um, I know TikTok has now introduced an AI um, policy and users now have to say when their content is AI generated. So it will have an AI generation uh, label. And this of course is just a band-aid, but it helps at least where AI can, you know, distort images and facts mm -hmm. and all that. Um, in terms of Kenya, I will also say that uh, Kiktanet and Article 19 are members of the National Coalition on Freedom of Expression and Content Moderation. And this is a group of civil societies, um, organizations in Kenya, learning institutions, social enterprises, working on technology and uh, human rights or human-centered approaches to technology. And we're able to brainstorm around these issues together. Last year, we came up with a resolution on gender disinformation, which I think was a, a, a very commendable step towards at least acknowledging the problem and strategizing on uh, ways to go around it, especially now on content moderation, because uh, this is a very nuanced topic. Anything that has gender aspects to it is very complex and uh, context specific. Uh, around the world, I would say Europe is leading in terms of regulating and asking for more accountability from tech platforms. Uh, it is a welcome step, uh, although maybe just a caveat from the Article 19 side is not to create the avenues for transparency to be uh, a way for government to also abuse it. Also, we know that governments have strong um, appetite for taking down content and uh, controlling the information that is out there. So as much as we put obligations on platforms, we need to be fair in those obligations. And those obligations might, should not be encouraging platforms to unnecessarily take down content. We've seen very progressive um, judgments from the, the European uh, region, again, not more of Kenya per se, but the European region asking platforms that once they have notice um, of harmful content, then when that notice is sufficient, they should be able to take it down. And if they don't, then uh, they can be liable. Again, uh, con platform responsibility should not be overly broad, but it should be reasonable given the notice the platform has and whatever is in their power to take down uh, that content. So those are the examples I can share. I'll give the floor to Victor. Yes. Um, yeah, I think those are very valuable um, uh, progress or successes that have been made. I have just to add um, one is that um, if you look at the advocacy by civil society organizations, um, and how social media platforms were five, ten years ago, you realize that uh, there have been a strong push, uh, you know, 
uh, civil society organizations, especially to get uh, people to talk about these problems and the challenge of uh, content moderation on social media platforms. And I think over the years, we've seen a number of successes. Um, the public pressure from the various campaigns have led to a couple of changes across uh, platforms. So, for example, you know, we, we saw uh, Meta introduce the, the oversight board. It might not be perfect, but, you know, it is a, it is a win by, you know, civil society actors to create some accountability mechanism uh, for the platform in terms of, you know, oversight and of the process for review of um, complaints against, um, you know, content that is taken down or not. Um, <clears throat> in terms of uh, the regulation front, um, and Angela has mentioned you know, the progress in the EU, but at the same time, there has also been progress at the multilateral level, where, for example, we saw um, UNESCO uh, need a process uh, of uh, developing guidelines for the governance of uh, digital platforms. And these were developed in a multi stakeholder process where all various actors were, were introduced. And um, these guidelines essentially, um, you know, put human rights at the center of, uh, you know, uh, social media platform operations in terms of providing a basis for how um, member states of the UN should um, regulate and the guidelines also outline key principles um, that uh, member states should have, should, um, should consider but also provide uh, you know similar principles that uh, social media platforms would uh, abide by in the process of of uh, you know tackling the emerging uh, challenges, so they call for I think human rights due diligence, you know more transparency, accountability, and you know accessibility of information, but also you know fair, clear, and uh, respect for human rights in in, in in content moderation. Uh, we also have seen another similar process. So the UN is also developing a code of conduct. So on information integrity on digital platforms are also under development and we also you know um are you know providing a similar message in terms of what uh platforms should do and at the center again you see human rights transparency and uh, multi-stakeholder approaches so uh you know previously social media was not in the conversation at the united nations and this lead is informed by you know, pressure from civil society actors. So I think um, the voices of the people are being heard and platforms uh, will have to listen to what people want. And I think while this sometimes might not be visible as successes, I think there are also very good measures of the progress that has been made over the past couple of years to develop ways to regulate these digital platforms, but also to put in place uh, standards and guardrails that um, will ensure that the users of these platforms can continue to use them safely uh, without any challenges. Uh, thank you, thank you, Angela and and Victor for Sherry. If I may add, I forgot. Um, there's the case in Kenya that was um, against Meta for the lapse in their content moderation mm -hmm. that led to offline harm. Mm -hmm. While the case is still um, at the litigation stage and I understand still at the preliminary okay. level, I think it should also give us very good jurisprudence on when platforms can be held accountable mm -hmm. for not uh, regulating harmful content. Uh, the interesting thing about Kenya's constitution is that uh, it binds human rights obligations, just not the state, but also non-state actors. And by that um, reasoning, uh, social media platforms might uh, face uh, suits in uh, national jurisdictions that are not necessarily the U.S. for human rights violations. Mm -hmm. So I think that's an interesting development in our own country. Thank, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you, Victor and Angela, for uh, <laughs> quelling my, my fears that maybe you would not have any response to this question on, on the positives. But I think um, these steps that have been taken, I think they are a, 
the, the we this we could call them successful in in this in 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 terms of the progress that is being made um I just want to open the floor now for any questions before we come back to Victor and Angela for their final word. Um, but um, you, if you if you have any question, you can unmute and ask Angela or Victor any question. You can introduce yourself first, and then um, um, you can also tell us who you are directing the question to, so that it's easier to to just moderate. Any questions? Are we, are we digesting? <laughs> uh, Sheryl, I've, uh, I've allowed a few speakers uh, to ask questions and also maybe to make comments to what uh, the two speakers have shared. Okay. Please go ahead. If I've given you a microphone, kindly... Uh, Dennis, you can ask your question or make your comments. Kindly. David, you can, um, in JJ, you can just maybe give us a list of how they can um, follow one another so that it's easier. So it's Dennis first and then? Dennis, Dennis first, then Isha. David. Uh, my name is Murevi Dennis. I'm an advocate, I'm an litigator. And my question was directed both I'm I'm lucky to know both Victor Capio and Angela. And my questions were two. One, what is the scope of OGBV? What's the scope? Secondly, Angela has touched on the issue of the mod um, the content moderation by the concerned platforms. But as a litigator, personally, I wanted to find out what has ha been happening in our legal system, especially through litigation, to ensure that if the platforms do not perform their moderation responsibilities, do we have anything ongoing in our courts litigation-wise? And not just litigation, especially on the issue of OGBV, because this is a space about OGBV, so that there is a lot of, we see a lot of defamation, things end up in court. So, as we look at OGBV, apart from moderation by the concerned entities, where do our courts come in? How have our courts pronounced themselves on what is OGBV? Has there been any attempt through the, our court systems to work or pronounce or create some jurisprudence on OGBV? And is there anything ongoing? That is something I wanted to find out. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Dan. Uh, Sherry, I would like to ask a question. Would you want to receive the questions first or uh, you will respond uh, to each so that we also give uh, an opportunity to other speakers, to, to other participants who would like to, to ask questions or to comment on the discussion? I think, I think we can take the first three uh, together. together. Yes. yes. Okay, that's all right. So, so next one is Alicia. I don't know if I can. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not asking any question. But I wanted to contribute to a few things. I don't know if that is correct because I feel like you guys are taking questions right now. No, can you just make a comment? We'll appreciate. Okay, thank you. So uh, it, it's really good uh, engagement. So my arguments, no, my my engagements were like, okay, you see, we say so much about like the uh, uh, we talk too much about content and maybe regulation of this content. But then uh, I think uh, we when, when these applications or when these platforms were being designed. They were designed with a culture. So if we have our 
if you have your contributions to maybe uh, uh, maybe uh, having having suggestions or maybe these are the contents that we we really we really want to be regulated in our space mm -hmm. I, i doubt if that if that is going to work from uh from a small group uh in mind that okay the government is very aware about the same so uh, i mean like i think it's a space where we all struggle in the government is really, is really struggling with we are also struggling with uh we have institutions that work to to do so much about this content uh, regulation but then uh, like i i believe the right now our country is made majorly focused on regulating the content that are internal but you see most of these platforms are external so i mean like i think or uh, we can go back to angela and victor i think um isha his 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 connection may have he's he might have disconnected but angela and um victor you can maybe address it as well from them yes as the respond to the other 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 participants can help the best to be because so that i will allow them So maybe I can just go on whether OGBV what is the scope of OGBV in our legal platform in our legal system sorry uh so online gender based violence refers to really forms of uh, abuse uh, online but we call it gender based because they are based on social contra constructs of what it means to be a man or a woman so the person is being attacked uh, not because of the content of the of their message but because of the social uh, of the connotations around gender so maybe your skirt is too short or you're an himalaya you know such um gendered uh abuse or, or connotations it takes very many forms it could be doxing it could be cyber bullying cyber stalking trolling sharing intimate uh, partner uh photos and uh, we've seen this especially i think uh, if we all remember covid Uh, the first patient to have covid uh the ladies uh, photos somehow got on x and they were shared everywhere we see this with women politicians uh especially during election period as a way to weaken an opponent so you start a, a, a tweet or a whole campaign just to tarnish their name for certain reasons uh, again always very gendered is it in our legal system is it recognized in our legal system um yes and no i say yes and no because uh technology keeps on changing and that means that you cannot depend on a legislation that was passed in 2018 to keep track of every other form of abuse that will come up thanks to technology so we have uh, it being dealt with in various pieces of legislation you can look at it from a breach of privacy point of view you can look at uh, it from uh, the Con the Kenya Computer Misuse and Cyber Crimes Act point of view you can look at it from a civil defamation uh, point of view so i hope i've given an idea of how ogbv is dealt with in our legal system uh, maybe victor can add yes i think maybe just to add to what what you mentioned uh partly one of the reasons why actually people go to the other forms uh for example going to file a suit and the privacy laws or the or the you know copyright laws especially in relation to to the disclosure of partial personal images online uh is because the sexual offenses act um was not you know this law was developed in 2006 and the offenses that are defined there um are not comprehensive enough to address um new offenses that have been produced or facilitated by technology and as a result um we find that lawyers have had to be creative um to look for remedies 
uh, under other existing legal frameworks, um, given the gaps that we have in our social law cases. So, um, there have been a number of cases, uh, for example, um, women whose um, images were leaked online or made public online, they've uh, filed um, cases uh, even under normal court law and have gotten remedies in the constitutional violation of the right to privacy and article 31. And they've gotten remedies. This was pre Data Protection Act. Um, now, at least with the Data Protection Act, there's a new new remedy to the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner to make complaints. Uh, previously, also under um, the Kenya Information and Communication Act, there were a number of cases um, relating to, for example, the, the previously the Section 29 of uh, which was repealed or found unconstitutional. Um, there were a number of people who were arrested for, you know, sending threats or hateful messages or things like that. And um, a number of them were actually uh, convicted under that provision. Um, also, under the penal code, there are provisions where you can, uh, you know, you know, hold people accountable. And uh, there are a number of cases where, um, you know, technology has facilitated um, the main offense. Um, and these have actually been, been used to hold these um, perpetrators accountable. Um, again, under the offense, under the Sexual Offenses Act, um, I think more recently we've seen, um, you know, these, uh, I would say, tourists, but foreigners, uh, who play on young girls, uh, especially at the coast, uh, and some of them have been actually arrested and um, charged with child pornography under the Sexual Offences Act. And I think there have been, I think, a couple of cases that, um, um, you know, uh, relate to child pornography and also child prostitution and indecent acts with children. And this already um, um, are, are, are available for, for review because, uh, especially with child porn, you see, there's the physical the offense that happens in physical space and then there's the production of the videos and the materials which are broadcast online. So the it, it has been easy to at least get them on the on the pornography bit because um there's physical evidence. Uh even if they don't uh, even if they they are not able to get the online variation, but because of also how that offense was framed. And because it talks about any medium and things like that. So there have been courts have been able to and I mean rather prosecutors have been able to be creative. Uh, litigants have also been able to be creative within the existing legal system to get remedies um, for for victims of uh, LGBT. Um I think also more recently, I think last year, the judiciary established uh, the uh, division of the costs that we're going to deal with um, sexual and gender-based violence. And this is also one way that the courts are also responding to the rising incidents of BDV in the country. So, um, get awareness for official officers. Uh, also, just the establishment of these units then makes it possible for victims to, to get justice uh, over and above the other existing mechanisms uh, that but you're already there. Thank you. Um, thanks, um, Angela and, and Victor. And just before we pass the mic to the next person, I think um, I would just maybe add on to this question, Dennis, is that at Kicktanet, um, when we started off, um, David Indeji had just mentioned some of our work pillars. One of them is policy advocacy. And what we have been doing recently is with... Um, the Ministry of um, Information and Communication Digital Economies had uh, has a sector working group that has been working on ICT laws and um, legal frameworks. And what we have done is also just um, recommend for definitions of um, different forms of online gender based of, of different forms of online gender based violence and um, the offenses, for instance, so that we have those offenses described there. 
and therefore it is it would be easier to hold a perpetrators accountable because as victor has rightfully pointed out what we are now doing is we are really over overstretching the very the laws that were enacted a very long time ago and we need to uh, we need to um, evolve with the times and with the different um, offenses that are now coming up due to technology i um they, in the you can give them you can give access to the next person or you can okay. give us a list of the next people to ask questions uh, thank you shari uh, mohammed uh kindly unmute yourself to speak and if any other participant on these uh kiktanet spaces would like to make a comment or make a, a question to the two speakers that is angela minayo and victor capillo kindly request for the microphone then i'll be able to give you back um i think i'll go back to angela and victor and being um working on in the digital rights space um what are you that what do you um view as the next steps for instance and also with just your final word on these issues of content moderation and reporting mechanisms what next steps should um different multi stakeholder um ma ma different stakeholders take and especially from a cso point of view and also platforms as well just as we finalize uh maybe i can go yes. Uh, just an observation, um, a Twitter account by Eva Tskoski live tweeted the run-up to Amada. Mm -hmm. That tweet is still on, it's still up. And this will just tell you how we cannot rely on reporting mechanisms on their own for content moderation because either no one has reported or people have reported and uh, X has not pulled down that post. That post also was a bit worrying or concerning because it also picks up on narratives around women that has been shared uh, on X post the Airbnb murders. Mm. Uh, a lot of this is what you get when you eat men's money or when you cheat, you should be killed. Very dangerous narratives around gender relations. That street is still on. Uh, the photos he posted, the screenshots he posted, they're still on until now, I have just checked. So that should give you an idea why we say content moderation is broken. What can platforms do? We understand the challenge is complex. There's so many moving parts in content moderation, but uh, there is a level of responsibility on their part, especially given that they have business models on these platforms and they're making money off these platforms that they should respect human rights even as businesses and they should have uh, an agenda lens to the both content moderation and the community guidelines that they have because i consistently see a lapse uh, of gender issues when it comes to technology and content moderation so for me it's just a rallying call for platforms, users, and other stakeholders in tech regulation to speak more about content moderation from a gender perspective and to ask and even uh, require them to share with us human rights impact studies that they have done and the risk mitigation they're taking about this problem. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Uh, Victor? Yes, thank you. Um, I think we need platforms to invest more in um, the reporting mechanisms. So this includes, um, you know, providing support for multiple languages, um, you know, streamlining the reporting processes and, you know, making them very clear and more prominent in the applications and uh, websites, and also ensuring that, um, you know, there are clear timelines for responses and also action once reports have been made. Those are areas where um, there have been um, a number of challenges. Um, in addition, um, is that it's important that they put in place uh, human moderators who understand, um, you know, the various nuances of, um, um, you know, OGPV content. Uh, and also the cultural context in where the complaints are coming from. Um, I think sometimes we might have, uh, you know, general moderators for all types of content, 
but it's also important that these moderators are specialized and they are trained to be able to actually um, understand uh, the nature of the reports and the various uh, complaints that um, are coming. Um, and in as much as they say that they're investing in technology, I think it's important for those mechanisms to be more proactive, but also trained better um, so that then they don't take down what doesn't need to be taken down, but they actually help users or facilitate users to, um, to report more effectively and also to deal with the content that is, uh, you know, complained of. Um, and I think over the past couple of years, the platforms have tried to provide additional tools, but the big complaint is that those tools are still hidden in menus, and they need to be more uh, prominently placed, and users provided with even uh, prompts to remind them of where these things are, because I was just looking at um, my WhatsApp, um, you know, it got a new update a few days ago, and now things have moved around, but, you know, there's no notification to users that um, the application has changed and a few things have been moved. The same for X, they rebranded, a few menus were removed, and, you know, users have to do this dance of looking for where the reporting thing is and there's no guidance from the platform so i think that's a big area that needs to be addressed and of course um i mean lastly is um we need platforms to be to provide more transparency reports um we disaggregated data um so that then we're able to understand um, the trends in ogbv especially in our regions um and enable us to develop more appropriate responses to um, the challenge of OGBV as we see it on, on this platform. We have had issues about um, disclosure of data, especially on X to researchers, and I think that's something that they need to look more seriously um, to address, uh, you know, the owner of the platform comes from this continent, or rather was born in this continent. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, and it should also start a touch from home. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, um, Victor and Angela. And also, thank you very much, David, for just being behind the scenes and um, directing all of us. Um, thank you all of you for um, joining us tonight on this conversation. Today we were discussing on the effectiveness of reporting mechanisms and um, contact, contest, content moderation. And um, I think um, from what we've discussed, there are, there are very pertinent issues and on effectiveness. We are not at, <laughs> there's, there, there's, there, are, there are lapses and there are gaps in, in, in the reporting mechanisms. And I think also what uh, as a takeaway as well is that um, the, the fact that content moderation is, is, is complex then it does not just shift that burden onto the users. And also, I'm very glad about um, when I asked about some of the success stories and the multi-stakeholder approach to it and um, the, the, the coalitions that are being made to ensure that we are holding um, platforms accountable. I think that is very, um, very um it's 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 a good it's a good sign and i think there's of course there's need more work to be done in this in this area and um uh, as well as also just holding the, the the platforms accountable i think there's still a lot of work to be done but um we are i think we are up to the task and um the next steps is of course now just ensuring that we are also very vigilant in terms of seeing what is happening on these social media platforms making the reports and if there is no responses then we also um we still want to have this conversation still and um even even as you conclude and as you go um just continue to ask you to engage with kicktanet and article 19 we both um organizations really deal with these issues and um if there's any report that you make and there's um there's no responses then you can also still um contact us and also we can still have these conversations further because you need to also see 
what is happening on the ground like um real life experiences of of court reporting and, and 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 issues of effectiveness so please continue to engage with us um at kicktanet um um at kicktanet you can follow us or we are we are a true ict <laughs> organization we are we exist on all social media platforms at on x on facebook on ig and on tiktok as kicktanet you can see our work you can follow our, our work at www.kicktanet.or.ke and of course you can also when you're on that platform you can also um look at our mailing um join look into joining our mailing list where you have these conversations and also you can see invites on on forthcoming um conversations and in any other events that are happening with kicktanet um i thank you all of you for staying until it's now 9 20 east african time i thank you for your patience and i thank you for your um yep, your participation and i wish you the very best um good night everyone um good morning good evening wherever it is that you are um thank you very much thank you sherry and um, thanks to everyone else it's an ongoing discussion keep sharing Follow Kicktanet, follow Article 19 East Africa, and have a good weekend. Thanks to everybody.